Welcome to Chapter 1, um, Human Resource Management and Organizations. By the end of this chapter, you should be able to um, reach these several objectives. Understanding HR management and being able to define human capital, identify how HR management employees can be core competencies within organizations, the seven categories of HR functions, and be able to provide an overview of the four challenges that face HR today. How ethical issues in organizations affect management and the key competencies needed by HR professionals and why having a certification is important. The definition as provided by the authors of HR management is the ability to design formal systems within an organization where you're managing the human talent so that you can achieve organizational goals. We need human resource management so that we can be able to address how best to engage our workers, um, performance needs, as well as further development of leaders within our organization and to be able to retain those workers. It's important to help manage healthcare and all aspects the different concerns we have about retirement, hiring, as well as, as our ability to educate our workers. We use it in order to manage a globalized workforce because as we know that as our organizations grow, we expand bo both in our outreach to customers, vendors, um, but also in our ability to have locations in other places beyond where we are um, located locally we are able to best manage our diversity needs and the fact that diversity is ever changing and growing, um, our sustainability concerns, as well as our placement of and our um, exposure through social media and how we go about facilitating um, sharing of employee knowledge and the expertise within our workers. Um, human resource management helps organizations deal with government regulations because as they change, as they um, expand, you need to make sure that your company is in compliance and also legally compliant. And it helps a smaller organization um, be more progressive in managing the human um, talent within the organization. Within a small organization, um, you need the same things and you're using it for the same reasons that a large organization does. It also helps to free those frontline managers from those primary duties so they can focus on what they need to focus on mostly. And so by having the support from an HR team, it allows people to then focus on their strengths. Core competency is your ability to create high value for a company. And... This is what helps an organization um, distinguish itself and differentiate itself from its competitors. What is unique about your organization from others? And so it helps you to determine your competitive advantage in the marketplace. It also helps your HR team focus on using people as the core competency, what those core talents and skills and traits and strengths that they have that will help distinguish them from others to help give your company a competitive advantage. Figure 1.1 is showing you the different types of assets an organization has. It's human, physical, financial, intellectual property. When we look at the human capital, it's where we combine all of the values and knowledge and skills, our capabilities, life experiences, and the motivation that we need um, as a workforce to project um, ourselves and to be able to um, reach for and attain um, organizational goals. And we call um, it, it intellectual capital so that we can be able to reflect on um, our employees' decision-making abilities, their creativity, their knowledge, and their thought process. When you look at the areas in which we can factor in employees' core competencies, you can look in the areas of customer service, organizational culture, and productivity, and understanding that employees um, can use these things and they can overlap in order to better enhance their core competencies. Productivity is, falls into um, our ability to um, quantify as well as qualify um, in our work that's performed and considering 
that quantity of that work and as well as the quality of the work that's being performed and how that factors into the cost of what we're using um, within the organization. So when you sit back and you look at what is being done, the quality of being, how it's being done, the amount of time that is being done, how much time is spent on each process, because the time spent is immediately equated to the amount of money that is being invested into that process. When we look at unit labor cost, we can measure our productivity um, by computing the average cost that workers um, of our workers and divide that by their average levels of output so that you can then see how much it is for each individual employee that you have working. You can actually calculate the um, how much your employee is costing or how much you're investing in having that employee work for your company. Figure 1.3 is showing you um, the different approaches that you can use to improve productivity and so when you look at your goals and then you have your goal is to increase your productivity and reduce the cost of labor per unit per employee you can um, look at restructuring or organization which you're going to revise that structure you can reduce staff you can um, and that will also help with ever your company is merging or being acquired by another company you can redesign the workload by changing it up you can combine jobs um, you can reconfigure a job, you can reshape them because as the technology changes, as we know every couple of years, technology is improving, you can reshape jobs um, factoring in that technology. You can also align your HR activities by attracting and retaining a particular type or quality of employees, um, the training and developing and evaluating them along the course of their um, time within, within the organization. And you can also in compensate employees and provide other HR activities. That compensation could also include bonuses and things of that sort. You can do a greater analysis of the work that you outsource to domestic vendors and contractors instead of the work that you um, keep in-house for employees. And you can also consider outsourcing operations internationally so that it is done abroad. Um, these are the four major um, areas in which you can help to um, improve productivity to, to reach that goal. This is something that my um, company, Foreman Associates, um, focuses on um, as well to be able to help organizations find a way because um, oftentimes it's not necessarily leaning out the company, reducing the staff. Sometimes it can literally be changing that workload or redesigning the work in order to maintain the amount of staff that you have, but that you can then be able to increase um, the output of the work being performed. When we look at customer service and quality and how that's tied to HR, it literally impacts the effectiveness of your organization. If you consider the fact that customer service is that interaction, that relationship between your employee and the customer, as well as the quality of the um, that service, because just because you're provide you're talking to customers doesn't mean the quality of that relationship is um, strong. It's enhanced. That it's positive. And so, making sure that you are providing a quality experience for your customers, but also for your employees as well. When we look at the organizational culture, it is the values and beliefs that are shared amongst the employees within your organization. And um, there's a, a rules of engagement for how we behave and how we conduct ourselves. This always starts at the top of your organization, whoever your CEO, your founder, whatever the title, the, the senior most leaders in your organization help to shape and, and mold the culture of the organization. So it evolves over a period of time and it is constant and it is enduring. It continues. So if you have a negative organizational culture, if you have an organizational culture that um, that tends to lean towards um, bullying and harassment and um, you know aggressiveness and calling people out of their names and um, things of that nature and having kinds of you know lewd um, you know, jokes and email threads that are going, understand that starts at the top. 
someone at the bottom cannot create that culture. It happens from the top. It is embraced. It is reinforced from the top. And so it literally creates the social environment and it can impact um, service and quality. It can impact the productivity of your workers. And at the end of the day, that will impact your finances. That is going to um, either drive your help drive your revenue or help tank it. So when you have companies that are focused on that bottom line, they need to understand that organizational culture has everything to do with that bottom line. Now let's look at the different functions of HR management and how um, they're influenced by what's happening on the outside of your organization, your external environment, which can be anything that's happening globally. So whether it is with world leaders or some kind of war or outbreak or um, health scare globally, um, the financial markets globally, um, environmental, whether it's locally or internationally, um, how the environment can play a role, um, if that can increase the amount of taxes or it can increase um, the cost of, um, of your logistics as far as importing, exporting, um, but also if it if somehow the water is contaminated or um, anything. So environment plays a huge factor. Cultural and geographic as well, taking into consideration that diversity um, that we have um, uh, within race and um, religion and in our uh, national sphere as far as um, people can take on a nationalistic approach. Um, and that can actually impact your internal environment. Um, our, of course, politics, local and abroad, um, anything social that's taking place, any activism, um, legal ramifications um, that can also um, have a major impact internally. Um, economic factors, as I talked about before when we talked about the global um, financial markets and things of that nature, um, interest rates and inflation definitely impact your organization. And then, of course, technological, because things are always changing. You can't still be using 1985 um, technology um, in the 2000s. So here's a different look at how we, at the functions, figure 1-4, shows when we look at strategy and planning, we can look at certain things um, such as um, retention and effectiveness, when we look at staffing, we can look at uh, how we analyze jobs to make sure that the jobs that are outlined in descriptions are actually the same, they're being um, performed in the same way. When we look at talent management and we can look at career planning, um, it's important oftentimes people feel that the job that you apply for is the job that you're just going to be in, but a strong HR team knows that they need to focus on um, sitting down with each employee to look at their career plan and where they would like to be, whether in within the organization or outside of the organization, because sometimes your organization is a stepping stone to something else. When we look at rewards, the different ways that we can incentivize, um, provide benefits beyond just the basic compensation of a salary. And then when we look at risk management and worker protection, understanding that we're, we're always having to be mindful of the health and wellness of employees, safety, security, and making sure that um, our employees are always um, well protected. And then what kind of plan do we come up with in case of disaster and how we recover from that disaster? And then when we look at employee and labor relations, what HR policies do we have in place? What do we need to follow back up on? Making sure that we're going through that list um, every year to make sure that nothing is outdated or um, that, oh wow, we haven't really been reinforcing this. And then also considering our relations between um, management and any unions. Of course, there are some organizations that have an anti-union um, position. And so um, taking those all into consideration. So these are the different ways in which you can look at it, how those fall into the technological, global, environmental, political, social, um, and, and external environments. So you can see how the external can then come right into the functions internally. Um, so as I've already mentioned these um, in greater detail already, keep moving forward. 
So we have various roles within HR management. Some of you are uh, actually currently employed in the um, human resource field. The core is our administrative, our operational employee advocate. We have strategic. Under administrative, you can have major shifts that are impacted based on the use of technology, as well as work that is outsourced, um, either domestically or internationally. Um, usually within here, you're doing a lot of record keeping, you're you know, taking care of the legal paperwork, you're implementing policy. Under a, the operational employee advocate, you're working to help identify and implement any needed programs and policies that will better enhance the employee experience um, and help with the organization reaching goals. You work to help with um, cooperate with managers to ensure that employees are being treated fairly um, and with uh, dignity and respect. Under the strategic role, you're having to address what's real, what is that is the not the perception of what's going on with the business, but the actual realities of what's happening with the business and focusing on what the business needs in order to not just survive, but to thrive. And so you have to help come up with ways to devise and implement success strategies and how to best use the workforce that you have um, and in order to reach those goals. So there's a, a mix of roles we have from the past to where um, where we see it in the future. And so you see it, there was a, a focus where the strategic operational and then it went to administrative where administrative was the, the bulk of HR. And that's what most people perceive when they think about HR. They think of the administrative role. They're like, oh yeah, that's the people that handle all the paperwork, you know, onboarding and offboarding. But the future of HR, which is where we're pushing this, 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 um, dialogue and this mindset is to focus more on that strategic is understanding okay here is where the organization really is here is where the um, the external environment currently is and where we need to be and so then we then focus on the that most we're flipping this this pyramid to another emphasis where it really should be by having this future focus, this puts the HR director, whatever their title may be, it puts them side by side with the chief um, executive officer, the CEO, where they're no longer um, just um, a byproduct of or just a you know something that you kind of, oh yeah, that's right, that's what they do. You literally, when you have this future focus of an HR department, you then realize that before you, that whenever you're making any long-term strategy moves, and strategy is long-term, anytime you're making any long-term strategic moves for the organization, you need to make sure the head of your HR is right there working on those strategic moves so that it can then be properly translated to how the workforce is going to not only contribute, but be impacted by those decisions. So there's various challenges that you have as an HR manager, um, always considering competition, right? There's the external factors of competition and globalization. It's the um, in factors of cost that things don't, there's not a fixed cost with certain things. Sometimes the products that you have to utilize to get the job done, um, those products can fluctuate. The product, um, the cost of transportation can fluctuate. So there's a lot of pressures with that. And you're trying to keep your costs low um, because, you know, at the end game, if you have to increase, that means it has to translate that you're going to have to increase the price to your customer, you, which could freak your customer out and make them now go to your competition. Something else you have to be mindful of is restructuring and how you're restructuring um, departments and divisions and possibly restructuring the entire organization. So that's a challenge. And then of course the workforce is constantly changing and the fact that we also have our baby boomer generations staying in the workplace longer, um, but being mindful of that we're having to learn how to um, bring in our and embrace our military um, workers and understanding that there's other um, elements and aspects of the workforce that's constantly changing. And then 
mind you, um, just understanding that technology is always a challenge because as you've gotten a workforce um, accustomed to a certain technology and way of doing things, then something new, better, more efficient comes out and now you're having to retrain. Sometimes you have pushback. You have the challenges of uh, workers not wanting to um, do what's new because they're comfortable with what how it was. So being mindful of that as well. When we look at um, competition and the pressures of cost and restructuring, there are certain factors that we must always take in consideration. And those are the shifts in jobs. So we have a, the highest percentage of shift in higher education jobs and the highest numbers shift in lower education jobs. And so with that, you realize that you also have a greater um, competition in the fact that you're having um, the greater need for or positions that are being uh, um, created where you're saying we need these or you need to have a higher education level to perform this job. What happens is, is that you're having skill shortages where you're having an inadequate supply of workers with the skills that you need in order to perform the new jobs that are coming to the market. And so there's this gap within what you need um, and what is out there. And so HR has to figure out ways in which they can close that gap. When we look at um, globalization, um, there's different types of workers. And um, if you're working in a second country and you're employed by an organization that's just headquartered in the first country, in your home country, you're an expatriate. And you have to consider the wages of um, what you would normally provide in your home country compared to the wages in the other countries, especially if you are a um, um, multinational corporation. You have um, locations and centers and um, offices in multiple countries. You have to be mindful of those wages and um, mindful of the external factors that um, impact those, which are include um, legal and political, cultural, economic systems, so on and so forth. So in 2012, um, the Bureau of Labor Statistics created this chart that showed the hourly compensation of manufacturing workers. And you see that um, U.S. is ranked at number five. This was in 2012. Um, and they were, the U.S. was paying um, about um, $35.67 an hour for manufacturing workers. You see it, the Philippines is at the bottom of the um, chart at number 10 at $2.10. And But you see Australia is all the way at the top at number one at $47.68. And so some people would argue, oh, well, see, we need to be more like you know Australia. Well, the, you also have to understand Australia is much smaller than the United States as well. Um, so if you look at the number of workers, there's a lot of things that are factored in, right? And so what happens is, is that um, you and the people start to do a comparison. And we, of course, we gravitate with what's more. That's almost $50 an hour. Of course, we want that. Um, but you have to look in the fact of how we also... Um, the healthcare cost and all the other factors that we have in um, our import export tariffs and blah 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 blah. There's so many different factors, but it is something that makes you look at the fact. Okay, we have Canada that's right above us, right? The Thorough Rock right above us is making a few, you know, a few cents more um, per hour. But interesting enough, even though with we're ranked as number five, understand we're still the number one global. Um, uh, workforce and um, powerhouse economically than these other countries. It's just an interesting dynamic. And then when you look down at Taiwan and the Philippines, um, you know, you're like, wow, imagine only getting paid $2.10 an hour. You can also factor in the fact of cost of living, blah, 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 blah. Um, I, I, of course, I feel that two, $2.10 an hour, it it's no surprise when you look at this chart, it's no surprise where you see the largest number of um, immigrants coming to the country 
it's no surprise where you're seeing people come from um, Korea, Taiwan, Philippines. I would, if I know that for the same amount of work, I can now come to um, the U.S. or Canada or France and be paid, um, you know, more than 10 times <laughs> what I'm currently being paid. So those are all factors that you must have. And so when you have a global organization, you have to be mindful of this as well. Um, so I've already basically covered the legal and political factors. Um, the one thing I will focus on is the role of HR when you're looking at these is that you have to um, do comprehensive reviews of your political environment. So looking at that external environment and looking at those employment laws. And before you begin operating in a country, you need to know what you're bound by and obligated to before you start your um, launch your company in a country because you could violate so many um, laws and have yourself in so many courts very fast. When we look at the four basic challenges when you're looking at HR globally, um, strategy, people, complexity, risk, right? The strategy is that long-term plan and how you're going to execute in order to reach that long-term goal. The people is, of course, your workforce, um, but also it's the vendors and your customers that those consider as people as well. And then the complexity in which you um, have to work within an environment that is not uh, familiar to you. It's not your home turf. And so there's different factors that you need to um, evaluate. And then there's a lot of risks that you take. Um, so these are the, the things that you have to be mindful of. And this is something that has to be interwoven into the larger picture of the organization that usually some companies don't factor in because they don't value HR and what HR brings to the table. But these are the four major areas in which they, if you look closely, this is something that's a conversation that CEOs have and CEOs have all the time. Um, but where are you looking at the human resource um, component? These are the four years in which you do that. Something else you have to look at is the diversity of your workforce, both racially and um, ethnically, and gender in all aspects of gender in the workforce, and aging, as I mentioned earlier about the baby boomers. You're having people working um, later, and what's in, in Important to understand that based on federal guidelines in the United States just alone, um, if you're 40 and older, you're considered um, an aged worker. Um, so, um, you know, most of us would consider uh, someone 65 as aged, but if you're 40 and older, you're considered an aged worker. And so understanding that um, you're having people that are in their 40s and older who are having to come back in the work workforce, having to um, reimagine their role in the workforce because initially they worked 10, 15, 20, 25 plus years at one company and they were laid off or the company went out of business and now they're having to reinvent themselves. And you're now applying for positions that a 20 year old, 25 year old is applying for. So you have to understand that as well. And it's important in HR not to discriminate. And oftentimes what we're finding out is that um, managers um, that are interviewing um, workers are easily able to ascertain the age of a worker and discriminate whether they know they're doing it or not based on the fact that when an employee, uh, a candidate submits their resume and you're seeing that they already have 20 plus years experience, you already know they're not in their 20s. So you have age discrimination that's, that's happening. There are various benefits of technology. Of course, it helps to improve your efficiency, both administratively and operationally. Um, it helps to reduce, reduce cost, um, helps with your strategic planning, recruitment, selection, and training. Um, it contributes to performance by your ability to collect and analyze data that's specifically tied to HR. There are various trends that we see. Um, of course, our mobile devices that can um, 
access HR information, um, enhance workflow, keep us connected um, to the workplace. Um, in the past, of course, when we didn't have these devices, you'd have to wait till you got back to the office. Um, that could that delay could be have a major impact um, on the um, a project or um, you know major business deal, whatever. Um, social media, of course, we have different wikis, text messaging, tweets, blogs, um, Instagram, Facebook. You know, um, this is the ability for you to communicate both within and outside of the organization. We have to, and this is something that is very big, and if any of you take the um, business ethics class with me, you'll see that I am, I push very heavily for um, ethics training and exposure, um, understanding that we have a lot of ethical concerns um, that deal with um, equal employment opportunities, um, training, performance management, development, compensation, and staffing. And the treatment within these areas can be either ethical or unethical. And there's various influences um, that can be a consequence to um, employees' absenteeism. You know, they're um, calling off work, you know, sick, coming in late, um, turnover rates. We're having employees that, you know, they're not staying long um, or being fired. Um job satisfaction, performance on the job, the decisions that we make ethically, and the commitment to um, tasks and projects and a commitment to the, the job and the company itself. So when we look at the culture and practices, we have to place greater emphasis on a written code of ethics. And it has to be one that is not shallow. It cannot be um, you know, thin. It has to be something that's in depth and um, healthy, and one that is started from the top of the organization, embraced and reinforced, encouraged, and then all, and then spreads throughout the entire organization. Um, that everyone is held to that code, and there has to be um, aggressive and enhanced training on ethical behavior because we can all see what's happening in the news all around that people really don't understand uh, ethical and unethical behavior um, because some of the things they're doing and saying, you you know, as the saying goes, it makes you want to clutch your pearls. Um, it's one of those things that we need to have it. It's really something that should start off um, in your K through 12 years of um, education um, to then be greater enhanced if you do go to college. But if not, it's definitely something that by the time you join the workforce at between the ages of, um, you know, 14 and 18, that you already have it embedded within you. And then, of course, then you have greater training in the workforce. There should be advice on ethical situations and how to handle those situations. And then, of course, there needs to be reporting systems that are confidential. People should be able to report unethical behavior um, in a way where no one knows it's them. So that even if you're going to be a whistleblower, you don't have to worry about the repercussions. Because oftentimes, although we are protected by federal law from um, as a whistleblower, People still find ways to punish you, um, whether the change your workload or um, demote you or fire you at some point. And, you know, they have this trumped up um, reasoning for doing so where they've been keeping, you know, records of your behavior, so on and so forth. And, you know, they just stall the punishment um, so that it doesn't seem to be tied back to the fact that you're a whistleblower. But if you have a confidential reporting system, then at that point, people are more apt to speak up and speak out about um, ethics violations. And then, of course, CSR, which is corporate social responsibility, those practices, as well as sustainability practices, are always tied into ethics. Um, what we do as a corporation to um, do well by doing good for those in the community, for the customers that um, purchase our products and services, um, for the communities in which they are, um, we take resources from out of those communities and how we can give back. 
as well as sustainability and the fact that we have a, um, we leave a smaller carbon footprint on the environment. Um, and we make better choices as to the physical resources that we may utilize to create a product or to execute a service. And then we look at our global differences. Um, this is just a reinforcement of the fact that we have to be sure to mind, be mindful of the values and practices and customs and um, cultures of other countries and making sure that we're complying with not only um, the laws within our home country, but also the other countries in which we um, work and interact. And looking at um, the legal and ethical questions that we have, whether or not um, the behavior or the result of our actions will meet the local, state, federal, international laws, regulations, and codes that the government has put in place, and whether or not the behavior result will meet the standards and of the organization as well as professional standards of being an ethical you know, behavior or um, act. There's different examples that you can look at as far as ethical misconduct. When you look at compensation relations of your employees and how we look at staffing and equal employment, as I've already mentioned in um, how we do um, the recruiting process um, is easy in which we can discriminate, but also we can show favoritism in our discrimination through our hiring and promotion practices. And the fact that some people may only want to hire women or only want to hire men or we don't want to hire transgender or um, we don't want to hire Muslims or whatever. And so making sure there's no favoritism in the hiring or promotion of any of our employees. Um, addressing sexual harassment, um, and the fact is, is that most people don't even understand the depth and breadth of social harassment and the various forms in which it um, arises. And then looking at the fact of um, recruiting and interviewing and the EEO discrimination that um, takes place within those two phases and then how we can do um, appropriate rather than inappropriate background in investigations. Um, when it comes to labor relations, um, dealing with you know um, dishonesty um, of not only employees to supervisors and coworkers, but also supervisors to um, employees and their own coworkers. Um, emailing false public information to customers and vendors um, misusing or stealing resources and assets of the organization, various supplies, those um, paper clips and um, staplers and rings of paper and books and office equipment, so on and so forth. Um, when you intentionally violate regulations that are um, in place for safety and health, and then when we look at compensation, when we're accepting personal gains, meaning um, allowances or whether we're accepting gifts from vendors. There are some strict um, rules that should be in place about that um, because a vendor could then have undue influence um, in the fact that you could possibly give them a bid for a contract that they would normally not have received or the fact that you gave them, a, um, you awarded them the bid and they never even had to apply for it because you've already accepted some kind of exchange. Um, when we have uh, personal bias in our performance appraisals, when they're not unbiased um, and we score highly or we score someone low on their appraisal, um, falsifying expense reports, and when we misrepresent hours and time that we worked. Um, all of those are unethical. Um, we have our SOCs, our Sarbanes-Oxley Act, which um, helps us to reduce, it does not eliminate, but it reduces the likelihood of illegal and unethical behaviors. There's different issues that we have to be concerned about um, that are tied to executive compensation and benefits. Um, this is, helps kind of put things in check where um, you had a lot of the accounting 
issues that um, took place. And what was happening is that, you know, these employees are being compensated grossly, just this huge exorbitant amounts while the company is hemorrhaging. Um, and there's this huge gap between what your workers um, are getting versus, you know, the top of the organization. And so all of this allows for a greater look at the, the, um, of the accounting system of that organization. It provides greater accountability in the fact of making sure that the company is doing um, what they're reporting um, in addition to the fact that you have sometimes a differing, because sometimes um, you're showing where companies were having double books. They're having their actual books of what they're really, how they're really performing, how things really are going on versus what they're sharing with their, um, their shareholders. And so you have people that have, per, you know, they've invested in stocks within this company and they're thinking that the company is doing well and they're actually not. So all of this is to kind of help reel that in and it requires companies to establish um, an ethics code to develop a complaint system for employees, have policies that are in place that prevent retaliation for those that um, are whistleblowers. Interesting enough, um, although you're required to establish these things and it does not, if you, there's, there aren't any extra layers of regulation that um, require companies to um, show that they're actually um, following up and doing a, an audit of this, an analysis of their code of conduct, um, of how efficient their complaint systems are, how um, confident their employees are of even being able to report to these complaint systems and, um, and the various um, policies in which um, whistleblowers feel confident in doing this reporting. There's um, some competencies that you must have in HR management, um, knowledge of strategy and strategic planning, um, legal capability, administrative operational capability, um, as well as um, the um, understanding of technology and its usage within the workforce. Um, Shrimp came up with this competency um, model that looks at your behavioral and your technical competencies. And you see it goes across this grid of looking at um, leadership and how to navigate your organization, your business acumen, um, how ethical you are and the practice in which you, um, you um, exhibit um, that ethical behavior, how well you manage relations, um, and then of course it goes into um, consultation, critical evaluation, communication, so on. And then it breaks down your HR knowledge in these domains based on your expertise of people, organization, workplace, and strategy, those four core areas. Um, and then it breaks those down even further into the functional areas of HR. And so when the core is then encompassed into um, whether you are an effective or ineffective performer that then will relate into um, successful business outcomes. And this of course was only um, broken down as far as to um, the US. So this is only applicable to those that were examinees that were tested within the US. But this is how they've They've given you a visual into the competency of um, an HR professional. When we look at HR and um, as a career field, you have um, generalist and specialist. So a generalist um, can perform a variety of different HR activities on different levels. A specialist has in-depth knowledge and expertise in a specific area. That's where they focus on, that's their strength, um, their core competency, and that's where they're going to focus the vast majority of their um, activity in workload. It's important to be both professional and certified. Um, 
you need to have knowledge in regulations as it's um, tied to employment, um, the laws, finance, tax laws, um, because of course, taxes are taken out of employees' paychecks, all right? Um, in addition to the fact that companies are taxed. And so the taxation of a company, how that then translates and is impacted upon the employees, right? Um, because if they're taxed heavily and the company is then looking at, oh my gosh, we have to cut costs, oftentimes what they do is they start cutting employees. But if you understand the tax laws, you can then be able to factor in, well, wait a minute, we can cut this out instead, or we can readjust this instead versus laying off employees. Um, you have to be mindful and understanding of um, information systems, statistics, how those statistics, uh, statistics um, factor into um, your organization, but also looking at externally. And then specific HR activities that um, engage um, your workforce. Um, there are some professional associations and organizations that you should do further research on. I mentioned SHRAM already. That's the Society for your, um, HR Management. There's ITMA, which is the International Personnel Management Association, World at Work Association, um, ATD, which is Association for Talent Development, and then, of course, um, being able to hone in your skills and knowing specific HR activities that need to be performed on a day-to-day, -day, um, quarterly, or annually um, timeframes. There are certifications um, that are provided through PHR, um, SPHR, GPHR. Um, there are some SHRIM exams and certifications um, as well as provided by World at Work. And then there are some that are focused specifically for specialists. So that is the end of chapter one. Um, hopefully through your reading and through this video, you have a greater understanding of um, what um, human resource management is all about and how valuable it is and can be for organizations um, worldwide. If you have any questions, please feel free to email me. Thank you.